Now, February deer chores, we're doing deer chores, could be habitat, could be hunting related. Every single month, we started in May last year. When we get to May this year, I don't know if we'll stop it or we'll start it again and add to it um, with going, what's going on right at that point. And, uh, and what clients are asking me because January I have 11 clients, uh, February 11, March 11, and we'll be pretty much going at that eight client to 11 pace all the way through September. And when I'm working with clients on a daily basis, we're together for eight hours to 12 hours every single day. And when that happens, then you can imagine the questions that come out. And it's pretty interesting because I see the same questions happening over and over again. And that's why we try to bring that information to you on the most relevant up-to-date questions that people are really asking in the deer woods and that translates into a lot of deer chores too so february deer chores what's interesting about february is i'm big on like six months 12 months you know those time frames nine months away three months away just seems like i think like that i always have to plan out many months in advance for client um client trips, uh, let alone Dylan even coming in filming. We filmed that, we figured that out five, six weeks in advance, eight weeks sometimes. And uh, it's just the way I have to plan it. But what's cool about the end of February is that there's only six months left until deer season. So that's a good thing. I love deer hunting and it's almost kind of depressing towards the end of the season. Uh, this year, I still have a buck tag in Wisconsin for better or worse. There's reasons for that. I've had my opportunities, trust me. Um, it's like, I don't know if you saw my mistake video, but those were almost all Wisconsin, if not all Wisconsin. And um, so on one hand, I really enjoy being able to hunt through this late season. It's one of my favorite times to sit in a tree, experience the snow. I love the smell of the snow, the woods at that time of year. I love that fresh feeling um, when I'm out there and it's really cold. We have the clothing to take care of it. And so that's a good thing. Um, but I, I really enjoy hunting through the end of January and I'm doing that this year. But boy, it's almost depressing when the season ends. I'm so used to figuring out the weather, watching the weather on HuntCast through the HuntWise app and really knowing when I can go into the woods and then all of a sudden the season ends. I've been hunting since early September and it is a little bit of a letdown. Um, I've learned to manage my hunts so I don't get burned out on hunting. My family doesn't get burned out. If you have a job, if you're managing your hunts well, that's what it's all about. The land doesn't get burned out, your tree stands, the deer, your boss, your family, your friends. You should get to the end of hunting season after a long season and feel kind of like, oh man, it's almost over, kind of depressing as opposed to, man, I can't wait for it to get done. This has been a grind. Shouldn't be, you know, hunting should be something you have a great love for and enjoyment for. What's great, number one, uh, deer bedding work is in January, I love scouting. You know, that's right after the season. That's when you can see a lot of November sign, December sign, even late October sign. You don't really care about that September sign where the shavings of the rubs are under the ground or under the leaves you're really looking for what were the deer doing in october november december and january tells you that as opposed to when you get into february march you're really looking at winter sign where deer are at in february is not necessarily where that november in fact most of the time they're not in the same location from november to february in most whitetail habitats around the country january great to scout January, great to locate future bedding areas or find bedding areas where in February, you're actually working on those bedding areas. And that's what we're doing. We're shooting a lot of videos now. I had a lot of videos early January. I went on a two week client trip in Wisconsin, Indiana, and quite a few clients in Ohio. And now it's time to get back, shoot more videos this week, do a little hunting. And then when I get back from my February client trip in Michigan, then you can bet we'll be attacking the woods and cutting in those bedding areas. We've already talked about some of those bedding areas, how they layer in, and that's an outstanding time to cut bedding areas. And two words of caution in there, complete cuts, where you're just taking, taking a face cut, you're cutting that tree down completely. A lot of this has to do with mature timber, you know, poorly formed timber, uh, non-harvestable timber, um, I like to maintain those giant oaks as mass producing uh, trees. I'm not cutting those down. If I had a forester out here, the ones that I'm leaving up would be the ones that a logger would want. And I don't want to cut those down. Um, they're fewer and far between, but I have a lot of junk in between that I can get down in the ground and create hardwood regeneration and a better place and home for not only whitetails, but wildlife in general. Those complete cuts are perfect because you cut the tree down completely. You're looking for sprouts eventually coming out of the stump when spring green up arrives, you're looking for that growth to take place over the summer. And a lot different than hinge cutting. For example, it's 17 degrees, you're hinge cutting a red maple, which is really easy to hinge cut and get down. And it sprouts along the, uh, the trunk very easily. 
So you have those vertical shoots coming off the side of the log when it's down. You're cutting that waist high. But if you're cutting when it's 15 to 17 degrees below freezing for too long, then imagine that sap that just pours out of it when you cut in late March on a warm day or April. It's in there and it's like glass. So you try cutting that down. For one, the tree won't give. You have to cut all the way through it and push it over. A lot of times they snap off, they don't hinge cut well. So I encourage you to hinge when it's warmer. When you get several days above freezing at night and you're getting those 40s and 50s days, and that's a great time to actual hinge cuts. We'll push hinge cuts off a little bit, unless you're down south. I was on properties in Ohio uh, this last week and we had a high of 48, I might even hit 50. So we had a high of one this morning here in, in Winona and across to central Wisconsin where Dylan came over from to shoot uh, videos. And so really watch, you're, you're taking those hinge cuts, you're hinging when it's warm or a little bit later, but those big trees you can just knock down and you're trying to get sunlight in and you're reducing canopy great time to cut right now in uh, February. Now shed hunting, a lot of people jump the gun. And what I mean by jump the gun is, I'm not a big shed hunter. I find a lot of sheds, I find up to 30. I found up to 30 on client properties on seven, eight different states in just one season. But that's when I'm out there and we're scouting whitetails and we're scouting where stand locations should go and how their property should be designed. When it comes to shed hunting, so many people love to shed hunt and I'm not knocking any of that. I think it's pretty awesome. It gets people out hiking. I don't need to have an excuse to go hike or you know have shed hunting as a passion to get me outdoors because i'm in the woods all the time and shed hunting is great because you can see what bucks are still alive but we have such a network of trail cameras on the property we hunt non-invasively so we get to see quite a few bucks per sit as an average and by the by the time we get into february we know what bikes made it through by our trail cameras personal observations maybe contacts with local neighbors and we know what bucks made it we don't need to shed hunt to figure that out and the patterns that shed hunting will give you or will offer you uh, don't necessarily reveal where those bucks are at during october november december it could be completely different where a buck drops his antlers in February, March. Now, if you have poor habitat in the general area, and I can think of an area of central Wisconsin over east of the Dells, north of the Dells, Dells there's a big sand vein that goes through there. And if, you're, if, you're, if you hunt there, if you're looking for sheds in that area, and you don't have a lot of ag fields, you don't have a lot of food plots, you might find the, the bucks are dropping their antlers right now, or even earlier in January, even end of December. You get up to northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, UP of Michigan, upstate New York, big open hardwoods of Pennsylvania, where there's not that high quality food source, you'll find that bucks drop their antlers sooner. I've even had someone back in the day, they, they kind of argued, they said that, uh, you know, bucks drop their antlers in a given area all at the same time. You know, just because they're up in northern Michigan, they're going to drop their bucks in a deer yard or in poor habitat versus somewhere else at the same time because it's all based on the lack of light, the amount of shrinking light in the photo period. And folks, that just isn't true. One of the things I can tell you about that is up in the Camp Cousineau Deer Research Facility in Shingleton, Michigan, they average about 225 inches of snow. Well, the supplementally fed and pellet fed deer on the inside of the enclosure, which were the same deer that were on the outside of the enclosure, just fenced in, they would drop their antlers in March, traditionally, late February, early March, even all the way through early April where the deer on the outside and the bucks on the outside were dropping their antlers by the end of December. And I saw that when I lived there for 14 years, that during the end of December, I would get pictures of, let's say I had pictures of 18 bucks moving through from migration and yarding, and bucks that were local, bucks that were non-local. Well, I would see that three quarters of those had at least one antler off. There was only 20% that had two still on their head. And the majority of those had at least one off, let alone a lot of bucks, probably half of them that had both of them off. And that's typical of areas where you have big hardwoods, you don't have those high quality food source ag fields, uh, really high quality cover areas. You could even have an ag, ag land area, but if it's all open hardwoods and they don't have that daytime browse that they can browse on during their bedding areas, then it's overall lack of food and they're dropping their antlers a lot earlier. And that happens Low quality habitat, northern extreme settings with uh, wind, temperature, snowfall. There's a lot of different factors. But think about that. If I'm in a good habitat area, early February might be a little early to go in and look for sheds. 
uh, around here in, in Minnesota. We're seeing some have dropped, but most of them have it. Same with Wisconsin. It's about the same, same situation, same location type. And, uh, but then when you get into the end of February, maybe early March, I'm really starting to look for sheds if that's what I want to do uh, in areas that are actually uh, really high quality habitats. But boy, by now in some of the poor habitat areas, you could have had all the bucks drop their antlers. So now is the time to go. And why not go too early? Because you spook the bucks off your land, they shed somewhere else. And unless you have a network of properties around your property to shed hunt on, say on private land, and you all your neighbors don't care if you wander around on theirs. I actually have someone I'm gonna let shed hunt out here. He's a shed hound. I like him, you know, he's one of my neighbors. I know him pretty well. So he's welcome to go shed and hunt out here because he's gonna show me any sheds that he that he finds. I wanna see Venti's shed. I just wanna see him. Um, it'd be cool to know that history of that buck and there's certain other bucks, but um, most of all, I just wanna know they're alive. And so shed hunting, really pay attention to the timing and the type of habitat you're in for, for February. Uh, tree stand marking, great time to scout in January again, great time to take your stands down if the season's over, but also February, that leads to a great time where you're actually marking trees while it's fresh in your memory from your scouting. A lot of us get involved in other activities during the winter time. And uh, I love marking trees for tree stands that I'm going to put in later, maybe March, April, May, even all the way up to August, depending on the tree. And we'll talk about that. Basically, if I have a lot to cut for shooting lanes, I want to put that up earlier in the year. Bottom line is I like to put tree stands and trees after there's been an explosion of growth in the summertime for the most part. You can clear shooting lanes before then, but I want to strap those stands to the trees after. Kind of think about it if you put a tree stand, you installed it in March, does it make sense you just added a year to that tree stand that you've had it in the tree? Because now you get the grow, growing season of the summertime. And if you say, well, I'm just gonna leave it in for one hunting season and you're gonna hunt it the second hunting season too. Now you just had two growing periods where that diameter of that tree's increasing. And then you have that wear of the sunlight on your cables, but mostly that tree's expanding and pushing out those straps around the tree. And so think about that when you're putting those tree stands in after the tree's grown a little bit in the summertime and it's full leaf out has taken place versus right before when that's going to happen. So think about marking those tree stands and, and really looking at it and then maybe clearing those shooting lanes more March and, and April. Travel corridor flagging, great time to do this because I'd look at your cutting later. I like cutting bedding areas this time of year. I like creating hinge cuts more March, April and that leads towards more cutting travel cord or say in April. Great time to mark those deer trails. The deer are gonna show you where they're traveling, especially if there's a little snow and getting those installed so that you can say, okay, I'm gonna cut later. And a lot of times when you're cutting travel corridors, you're just getting logs on either side of that travel corridor, depending on the size of your timber, but perpendicular to that travel corridor so deer can feel that they can escape. Never create parallel cuttings along your travel corridors. You see that online a little bit. You don't wanna do that. Deer might, accept that if they're forced to in limited cover areas, but they don't want that. It's very high stress for them. No different than cattle in a cattle chute. A lot of times that's where a cattle prod comes in. You have to move these, to move the cattle through those chutes, hogs, whatever it might be. They don't want to necessarily go down that tunnel. It feels stressful and there's no different with deer. So you're completing perpendicular cuttings, but really it starts with marking in, in February. Change batteries. I like changing batteries this time of year. I wanna see again what bucks have made it. I wanna see, I wanna make sure that every antlered buck that I know of, I can identify and see they made it through the season. Now what we find with our excess trail cameras is a lot of times I'm changing those lift two batteries. We're taking a 10 second video. I'm cha changing those in September, October, and they're still taking video of us when we show up in April to take them out of the woods for a month. Now. I've even had a camera I left in public land down in Ohio for 365 days and we got 365 days of videos and it was in a remote spot on a scrape. We didn't get a lot of deer, but it was really cool to look over several hundred pictures on a long delay over a long period of time, long delay setting on the camera over a long period of time and enjoy those pictures and really get to see all those seasons and the deer use in that area. And, uh, but really changing your batteries sometime in early February. I leave my cameras out till April, simply because April you can't identify the new bucks, early May, that are coming in. And up until that time, we have a lot of bucks that are holding in March. And then we still have a couple that we'll see with antlers on in early April. 
and that's normal for around here. People say, wow, they're really holding late because they saw a couple. But that's normal for the area. Normal shed dropping time around here would be mid-February to mid-March. And so that affects your shed timing and looking for sheds too. Good time to change your batteries just to make sure you get that last glimpse of pictures and especially depending on your cameras. I, see, I go to a lot of clients are grabbing a camera they haven't been to for a while and it's been dead since December. So maybe a good time to bring some batteries along when you change a card if it's out depending on your camera, you know, with the high level, high quality cameras will last a little bit longer. And number six, February, take a hike, a whitetail hike. And what I mean by that is get to know your land. That's something we have cuttings to complete here, um, a little bit of travel corridor work to do, and we have hinge cuttings later. But boy, what a great time to walk through the woods with very little impact. Again, I don't really care about shed hunting too much. So if my neighbors find the sheds, that's great. We already know those bucks made it through anyways. But I want to know every nook and corner of the property and so when we get those midwinter melts and I can make it through the woods easily or walk on top of the snow with snowshoes then um, this is a really good time to get to know your land. You're getting to know your land at a time when there's no bugs, no leaves and I think it really emphasizes, emphasizes that people ask when do you like to go on properties? Well I go on properties every month of the year. I go on properties typically just mid-December through mid-September so I'm all summer I'm going at the same rate on client lands but if I had to choose it would be midwinter mid -winter with frozen snow no leaves on the ground no bugs and really easy to get around the woods and see the entire lay of the land especially if you just have a little bit of snow on the ground and so what a great time to walk around your property when you can still see really well it's not during the season it's kind of that tweener time where it's not hunting it's not leaf out you're not necessarily scouting, looking for specific buck bedding areas and travel corridors and sign and rubs and scrape. You're just simply getting to know the land. It might be a great time to do so with family, friends. But February, like we've been saying since May and completing these habitat and hunting chores every month, there's always something to do. There's always something to keep track of. And what's something you have to consider with all this, it's pretty hard if you don't complete your February chores to make up for it in May. If you don't work on the land in February, March, April to make up for it in May or June or July. A lot of these things that you can do are monthly specific, even weekly specific, and timing is everything. And when it comes to February, there's a lot to do. I hope you guys get a lot done and it'll really count towards your white tail success this fall. Now, as we transition into habitat season, I hope you've had a chance to check out my web class, how to design your, web, your white tail parcel. It's on my website whitetailhabitatsolutions.com. I have a link in the description and I hope you can find it, check it out and enjoy it this year.